And I actually wanted to say, I'm no longer working on prioritizing the new class because it's already a part of the effort for now quite a while. But we're definitely uh, improving our services. And today I'm talking about the Uniprod's profit endpoint as it is in production for you free to use today. First question that people often ask is why do you even provide strong endpoints? Well, that question might be quite silly here, but outside for many biologists it makes a lot of sense to ask this question. Well, the first one is small laboratories where there's only 10 people or only five do not have a bioinformatician that can run all the different databases that you need. The kind of procedural approach of everybody in their own data warehouse doesn't scale because it always means in practice that your data is out of date because you haven't updated it in years. Um, there's no federation, there's no app. I don't know how you want to just join in this database and see if that any sense. And there's no standards. So there's lots of problems moving from MySQL to Postgres to Oracle to DB2 or whatever other relational database people use. We have also found out that document takes to rest, while it's very easy to program, very easy to get some data over JSON, it's just not enough. And we definitely have tried because such products definitely have been available over REST interface for more than 20 years. We started out with email, when there was a notable ad symbol in email, but really, we've tried this. It, it's just not good enough. So for the very deep mathematicians, the mathematicians who now really want to ask difficult questions about data, we give them a small endpoint, where it basically says, this is the data, as fine grained as detailed as we have it, use it, and we do. It's free for you to use. You can go to it right now, sparkle.org, has about 15 billion pupils in it. We try to provide some documentation for how things are linked in the different graphs, in the different data sets. No documentation is perfect, and ours certainly isn't, so we're always looking at improving it. And mostly what we really are there is if you want to ask us a question, if you have some idea like, I think that data is in product, but I'm not getting it out, just send us an email. We're really happy to help. Uh, we really get every week a question from a biologist that is just trying to find some information in fork, and you can't. There's no way that this document centric the rest of the face will give you that information. But then give them a Sparkle query and it exactly answers their question. And this is just one of the services we provide. Our services run on a nice amount of hardware. The hardware is open source for the capacity, but it is there to make sure that we can provide services that you need. Very simple, you can attach the demon in front of our instances, a very small virtual machine. And our instances are basically uh, 64 machines, quarter of terabyte of RAM, and consumer SSDs. This is not so expensive anymore. When we bought it, it was expensive enough, but that's already three years ago, and this hardware lasts quite a while. What we do, we have a Sesame, OpenRDF, Java, Tomcat, Classical REST, server engine in front of the virtual OSL databases. And in our case, we really use the, uh, the Tomcat and Java service engine as the manager for the database. So when we start up the database, we create a new database user, we log on the database, we make sure it runs, and we have you know, timers to make sure that it keeps on running and it's done, we restart it automatically. But even that's not enough, because at this point, when you get about 99.5% downtime in a month, you're basically realizing that um, your main source of downtime is the electricity network in the university. So the next step for making sure that we are even better at them, that we can have more federated queries that will work automatically, is to distribute our machines over multiple data systems. So somewhere next month, one of our servers will drive down the highway and move from Lausanne to Geneva, and make sure that we really, even if power fails in Lausanne, we have something going in Geneva. And, well, both fail, but okay, we have some time, but we really try to avoid it. 
really try to make sure that as a production service, you can depend on Spark or any product org, just as you can depend on us running www.inproduct.org. And this is all possible because of our uh, other group in Geneva, Amazon, the big other day, who will really give us good system admins and with a uh, very nice hardware buddy. The nice thing about info is that we do monthly review cycles, and that is always in sync. So it's a little bit batch oriented, so it makes life a little bit simpler. And we definitely have a dedicated machine outside of the tool, which are used for serving your queries <laughs> to load all the data. And it used to be that loading RDF was really something that kept me busy. But it hasn't kept me busy in the last two months because that's basically a solved problem. Um, we currently run it about half a million triples per second, it means that all our data is loaded well within 10 hours after doing some queries for statistics. And we could get it higher if we wanted to uh, a million triples per second, that's basically at which point our enzyme, well, our algorithm starts saying, well, this is as fast as I can unzip your data, so at that point that becomes the bottleneck. And the RDF ingesting engine is really not the hiccup anymore. High values are possible, we just need to split our files into smaller parts. And uh, the highest observed rate we have done is uh, two and a half million uh, uh, triples per second uh, to uh, to no excavated cluster. So that really is a soft problem even for small dish budgets. We use uh, Virtuoso 7.2, one now, and we have a software. It's a very nice color database. Also, if you're just doing SQL, it's quite fast. But the really nice thing about opening software is that you have a very small uh, help disk. And it's not just that you have very good performance. You really have many queries that are quite complicated and that you give results in very short times, even on aggregate data that really quite scans over a significant amount of just raw strings. There's always a big problem that well. All these database engines are never quite 100% spec compliant. Uh, there's always a few corner cases. Uh, for Google, definitely has them. We have fixed many of them in the last uh, year. And you should always pay attention what are the default settings in your uh, query engine. Are they good for you? For example, Virtual also turns on this feature that you have to call anytime query, which basically means if after five seconds I have a partial answer, I'll pretend that it's the full answer. Um, this is not what most of our users want. It's sometimes very good, but sometimes it's definitely not the desired behavior to make sure to turn it off or tune it to the right settings. Um, Sparkle is an extremely flexible query language, and that also means that it's probably a source of lots and lots of security holes and other issues that as a Server admin who keeps you awake at night and uh, during the day and gives you lots of nightmares. So, do give a lot of thought about securing it if you make it openly accessible so that it's set up the right C group, GL, C groups, make sure that nothing is readable that shouldn't be readable, uh, temporary accounts, limited accounts, all these kind of fun things that uh, they will have set up, but once set up, they'll also give you a lot of hassle. The challenge is as a firewall. Um, well, you never know what you're going to do. At least I never know what you're going to do. I suspect that the query load this week will be slightly higher than normal. Um, so it's very difficult to provision because one day you're all on one day, and the next day you come back and you start asking these really difficult questions. Um, the simplest queries are often the hardest. The default queries that you often see for many endpoints. It's really difficult to query the answer for it. How many triples do you have? Or how many classes do you have? What you actually find is that once you actually ask the biologists what your question, they become very, very specific. Those questions are actually very easy to answer. It's the very ones which are what kind of data do you have that are difficult. And the query timeouts are not sufficient because we basically are always looking for 100% utilization. We want to do the best that can. 
So we don't want to stop after five minutes because uh, five minutes waiting for a query is quite all right. The other alternative is writing a script that takes you at least half an hour to write, two hours to download the data. And waiting for five minutes for a proper query to return is completely acceptable. And sometimes that period of time could actually be a month because that is the alternative waiting period. The other challenge, of course, is always the amount of data, uh, data that is growing. We had a nice little dip uh, earlier this year, but we're back to score more growth rates, so we're definitely going to get lots of different entries. And I can tell you, well, please stop sequencing, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you're all discovering more and more data, what we have to do is make sure that out of all that data, you actually gain some information, and with that information, I get some knowledge and actually be able to do something. The other challenge being the queries. This is a large scale uh, of all the queries we get in different months. So this month's uh, normalized. And you see that we get a lot of queries, but this is not the whole number, because sometimes we get lots of easy queries, where there's only one basic graph pattern, only one triple and one variable missing. And other times we get queries which are about two megabytes in size. And that's a big query. And that is quite different in the amount of work that we do. Because in each case, it's just one query. Giving us a very difficulty of trying to figure out how much work we can actually do for you. For in product work, it was very simple. If it was, you could say, well, that many records were asked for, that many queries were done. And each of them had a very predictable load on our servers. Now, we can ask very, very hard queries that have made our machines run for very long time. But it's very difficult for us to figure out how much work did we do for you. But the nice thing is, we really know that our real users, it's not as many as for WWE to pay for our And it never has to be that many users. But we know that at the minimum 300 new humans, because it's a minimum 300 different user streams, IP combinations. We also know that you're real humans, because like real humans, you go on holiday in summer, and you really see a big drop in August, because you're all at the beach, not doing sport. And that's good. But we know that the service is being used, definitely in comparable rates to what we have for bottom market on the services, which were looking at the same kind of data integration questions. But definitely at a lower maintenance cost. This is not the only service that we provide in RDF in uh, the Cisco group. We actually have quite a lot of different small and different projects, some of them a bit more uncovered than others. But the first one of the new projects definitely for us a linking hub of data that makes sure that other pieces of information can be used and we try to reuse the knowledge to gain our learning how to propose powerful at scale for the other pieces of work in the Swiss Product Group and SID. At this point, I'm open for questions. Thank you.